Good morning. It's good to be together with the Holy Spirit binding us together. We're worshiping the same God, loving Jesus, hopefully, welcoming Jesus into our hearts and into our lives and into our congregation. And so one could think, why having a sermon about welcoming Jesus? That's why we're here, because he is so welcome in our lives. We will think about that as we, as we go through this passage and as we understand the deeper meaning and why this is actually in the Bible. Jesus had encounters with so many people. Why would this tax collector who had to climb into a sycamore fig tree, I will, I'm only going to say fig tree, that's easier, uh, to, to be able to see because of his stature, <laughs> like me. I would also have had to, to climb into some kind of tree to see what's going on. Today is the first Sunday during the season of Lent. Forty days before Good Friday, including Good Friday and, and still Saturday, we, we think about, in a very focused way, and in a very open way, open for the Spirit, open for the Word of God, open for God and Christ to work within us and through us, to guide us on our journey with the Lord, a very significant season in the church. Unfortunately, so many people think it's about giving up something. No, it's about adding something. Lent is about adding something. And if we give up something, it must be to help us to add to our lives, to add prayer to our lives, to add a welcoming heart and spirit to the Spirit of God and to our Lord Jesus Christ and to one another. It's about adding to our Bible study and our Bible reading and our contemplation and our meditation about Christ about his, his ministry, above all about the blood that he shed, the body that was broken for us, as we will come and, and remember that and contemplate that eventually at Tenebrae and on Good Friday. So it's not wrong to fast something. I'm not saying that. But it becomes sometimes a little bit of a legalistic thing. And I never could understand how not eating chocolates would make me close, come closer to Jesus. Nobody could ever explain that to me. Um, and I, I'm not really interested in the explanation too. But if sacrificing something that's important to me helped me to remember that I need to focus on the journey that Jesus took for me, first of all, secondly, the journey that I am walking, with Jesus, and, and in the last instance, coming to a place of renewed remorse about who I am and what I do, come to a place of a renewed penitence, sadness, and, and, a, and a, <clears throat> a need for forgiveness. If whatever I sacrifice or decide to, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't have to do it, but if that is what I want to do, it should add to me adding in a spiritual way to my life. Growing, a time of growing. The, the background is very sh simple to understand. In the 3rd and the 4th centuries, it was decided by the Christians that all, con all people who converted to Christianity would be baptized on Easter Sunday, and there would be huge uh, congregations or many towns would congregate together, and a particular uh, leader in the church in that area would would baptize all who came to Christ during the previous year. But in order to be prepared for that huge baptismal celebration on 
the day that when we, uh, the church remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they had to come together and be trained and educated for 40 days. And what the church fathers said that if Jesus had to stay in the desert for 40 days before he was ready to start his earthly ministry, so should we not also need 40 days like Jesus? That was the, 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 how they discussed this, how they shared this with one another. Also share 40 days of intense learning and, and uh, commitment and contemplation and mediation and working through our remorse and working through our, through our sinfulness and our mortality and face all of that and eventually celebrate that in the resurrection of Christ, as we come out of the water of baptism, we are given a new life. We are forgiven. We are cleansed. Uh, we are on our way and our journey for the rest of our lives with God in Christ. What is interesting, though, is that those who went through this 40-day preparation for baptism came the next year to the, to the church leaders and said, can we join again? Because it's a year later, there are some things we have forgotten, there were some things in which we were not faithful. And so there was an open invitation to participate. And that is where the season of Lent started. In the year, somewhere in the 3rd and the 4th centuries, eventually. During this period, it obviously evolved in many traditions, in many ways, in, many, in all the different denominations. But what all of Christianity has in, in, uh, in common during this time is that through remorse, through penitence, through a need for forgiveness, we can be set free and we come new again. We can, so to speak, rise from the waters of baptism over and over and over again with Christ and become victorious and celebrate the living Lord above all. And so welcoming Jesus would be a theme for Lent. Not about what you should eat or drink or not play, but your focus should be, how do I welcome the Lord Jesus Christ anew in such a way in my life that it will change me and change everything that I'm about and help me to be victorious in the living Christ. Zacchaeus was a short man. That was very clearly stated by the Gospel writer. Must have made some impression on him, on Luke, if he was around at the time. And on account of his curiosity, who this Jesus is that he heard so much uh, being spoken about in those times, he climbed into this huge fig tree to be able to see quite well when Jesus passed. We know the story from our Sunday school days. What is interesting to note is that Jesus did not just walk past him. It's something we must take to heart. Jesus, knowing everything, being the Son of God, having knowledge of everything that happens and, and, and all our attentions and all our actions and our words and our thoughts, knew there in the tree little Zacchaeus was, was waiting to see him, just to, because he was curious. And so it was not so much the action of Zacchaeus that is the focus of this being part of Scripture, of this narrative of what happened. What is important that Jesus came to stand under that tree. He came to, to take time to look up into the tree and say, Harry, come down. Hurry, little man, come down. I am staying at your house today. 
and we read that he hurried down, that he was excited to welcome Jesus. And we must be sensitive and sensitized this morning to understand, to experience, when in whatever circumstances, whether it's because of curiosity, we open the Bible and we read, whether it is because of curiosity of, about who's going to be in church today and coming to, to socialize, whether it is for whatever reason that we are engaged with a scripture or with a church or with fellow Christians uh, at, the, at the Bible study group or whatever, that we must know ultimately it's not we, it's not our call to say, Jesus, come into my life, come into my home, come into my relationship, come into my marriage, come into my parenting. I know that's what we were told over and over again over many years. But there's very little about that approach in the Bible. The whole Bible has been written about a God who calls us to be available for him. Abraham was an idol worshiper who never heard about the God who created the heaven and earth. And God, through the Spirit, came and spoke to him in such a way that it was quite clear to him that he needed to leave that town of idolatry and go into the desert so that God could teach him and show him who the God is who created the heavens and the earth, the stars, the moon, uh, everything that exists and created him and wanted him not to worship stones, and metal, but to worship the living God who created everything. God called Abraham. Abraham said, here I am. That means, yes, I will come. And you can page right through the Bible, Old and New Testament. And you find God in a burning bush being ready to call shepherd Moses to become the leader of his people. The prophets, the kings, the apostles, when they were disciples, it's such a biblical truth that I am amazed that we don't make more about this. And perhaps we don't have that expectation because Jesus is not walking around us in, in, in physically, as he did in those days. I don't know why we miss the point of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. That we come, we hurry down, like Zacchaeus, because God says, come down, come to me, make peace with me. We, we, we are welcomed by God before we can welcome Jesus into our journey and into our lives. To catch a deeper meaning of this story, we must understand that um, Zacchaeus was a tax collector, a senior tax collector, apparently. And what were they doing? They were Jewish people who would collect the taxes paid to the emperor of Rome amongst the Jewish people. That, first of all, made him a hated man. It was seen as a renegade, a traitor, a turncoat. Who would, who would, for personal enrichment, accept a job to oppress Israel further in order to get the money for Rome to administrate their very expensive empire. And more than that, there was no rule from Rome's side to forbid them taking more money than the tax amount that Rome wanted. So they could actually add their commission in any amount as much as they wanted to. And they were known to ask too much for that work. So the Jews hated, the Hebrew people hated tax collectors because they were turncoats and because they were dishonest and because they were robbing them on a regular basis. These were not people that you openly socialized with. 
good, proper Jewish worshippers who went to the, to the temple regularly, who went to synagogue on a Friday night, who were looking to understand God's expectation from them in studying the law of Moses. They did not openly socialize with these turncoats, with these people. Jesus said, Jesus decided to call a tax collector from the tree. Hurry down. I'm spending this day in your house. I'm having lunch with you and your friends. Curiosity might have brought Zacchaeus to the tree and motivated him, climbing into the tree to find out what is this fuss all about that I hear so much. But God had an appointment with him. Jesus had an appointment with him. Jesus used his curiosity to make him call him very, very clearly in that moment. What would have happened if he said, no, I'm just here to, to have a look at you, Jesus. What if he ignored the invitation from Jesus for him to take him with, with him to his house? I don't want to speculate on that, but I think we see that happening all too often in people's lives. That they are called that they are spoken to, often since a very young age, by parents, by grandparents, in Sunday school and other places, even in school often. And that God is calling them, and God is telling them, come down, come here, make peace with me, be my, my child, be my friend, be the one that walks the way with me. And that they do not respond to that call. The Bible says it's God that takes the initiative. The Bible does not say that everyone who is called replies positively. Has to live with that, with the consequences of not accepting God's invitation and the invitation of Christ to be welcomed into their lives and into their homes. And they have to live with it. One of the saddest things is to do visitation in, a, in, a, in an old age home and have a time of worship and there are people who are absolutely determined not to be there. And if you try to speak to them as you should as a pastor and say what well, you know, you have all the time in the world. Instead of sitting here, why don't you just sit in the, in the other room and hear God's word? I don't believe in God. I'm not interested in God's word. And so there's an expression that old age uh, conversions are extremely rare. And it's known. Most people responds to God's invite in their teens and twenties. So, the mercy of God is revealed in Jesus calling on Zacchaeus. And the grace of God is revealed in the faith that the Holy Spirit planted in his heart so that he hurried down with excitement. You see, he couldn't believe that a good rabbi, a good teacher of the word, a good man who lived a holy life would undermine his personal clean, cleansing, ritualistic cleansing, by coming into his house. It's normally it would imply if you went into a house of somebody like Zacchaeus, you'll have to go for ritual baths and you have to do a special sacrifice. And you have to go to all kinds of 
ritualistic actions to be cleansed again because you spoke to a man like Zacchaeus. And so people would avoid it. He would not, he had not the faintest idea that he would be called. But when he heard the call, there was no hesitation. And that's important. He hurried down and with excitement took Jesus to his house. Although we do not invite Christ by our own decision, although we don't take the initiative, the question remains, with how much excitement do I every morning welcome Jesus to journey with me? Does it even occur to me that Jesus wants to walk with me, drive with me to work, speaking to me, engaging with me, and that hard and tough meeting that I have, and that place where I have to go, which is not a good place for a Christian to be, uh, that he wants to go in all of those circumstances with me. Are we going to, with excitement, realize I'm not alone? Do you actually know that Jesus is here today? Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am with them. Jesus is here. When I was still the minister at Centurion West, one of the members, after the, the, the prayer of intercession, stood up and prayed in tongues for a minute or two. And somebody interpreted and we went on, continued the service. And a mother with two small girls, five and seven years old, the seven-year-old said to her, Mom, what did Auntie Lucy do in church today? Because this was... As in most Presbyterian churches, not something that happened every Sunday. And she said, how can I explain this to a Savior? She said, Jesus touched Auntie Lucy today. But that's not the point I want to make. The point is that this young girl said to her mom, Oh, was Jesus around today? <laughs> Was Jesus there? So I want to, and the next Sunday I, I told the story in church and people said, wow, did we realize that Jesus was around? Calling on us to walk with him, journey with him, to learn from him, to, to, to be defended by him. To be guided by him, our rock, our salvation, and our future. Yes, Jesus invites himself into our lives, but we can lock the door. Remember the book of Revelation, chapter 2, I think it says, I, I stand at the door and I knock. And it's actually in the context speaking to a congregation's door. This was a congregation who locked Jesus out of their worship and out of their learning and out of their divine activities, their religious activities. And Jesus said, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. And if you open the door, I will come and eat and drink with you. I will come and have Holy Communion with you. <coughs> and so we come through the door and we're greeted by very friendly greeters. And that's a good thing. But do we see Jesus welcoming us? And when we walk home, when we walk through the door, even though in the sending part of the order we are sent out to walk with Christ, to go in peace, to go in the, in, in the knowledge of the Lord, do we only say goodbye to the preacher of the day, or do we take the hand of Christ and walk with him 
through the challenge of Blue Monday and Good Tuesday and Wednesday and every day and every situation. Jesus offers himself most of all and first of all. Yes, with this offer comes forgiveness of sins. Of course. With this offer comes spiritual growth. With this offer comes the promise that I will bless you, I will anoint you with my Holy Spirit. You will receive my Spirit. I will be around. <laughs> Even when you're not worshipping, I will be around. I will be there for you. <sighs> Some people told me that they don't think it's such a good thought that Jesus is around all the time because they may be embarrassed by this thought because of what they're doing and the choices they're making and the activities they engage in. I'm not going to reply to that objection. I'm just going to say, listen to what he says to you through his word, through his spirit, through his interactions with you. If you're welcoming into your life, it does not mean, unfortunately, that you're going to turn into somebody perfect immediately. But you will be sensitive that the Lord is with me. He guides me. He looks at what I'm doing. He sees me. He is there. He is not judging, but he's concerned. So often we must admit that we were on the brink of making a disastrous choice or decision and that we were withheld, even against our will sometimes withheld. And when we look back later on, we do know that we were saved and protected and that Jesus was around and that we did not make that disastrous, horrific decision. Jesus is here. And he doesn't stay here. I know I'm stating the obvious. I'm not underestimating your intelligence. I want us to remember. He's not staying here. We don't lock him into the sanctuary until the next meeting of God's people. And he's God. He can be anywhere, everywhere, all the time. Doesn't matter what you drive or how you move from here further. He wants to be in you and with you and follow you. And he wants to guide you and protect you. He wants to be part and parcel of everything that we do. I've preached that, don't worry. Um, what, what the last the last thing I just want you to hear today is that it was not a general invitation to all the people in the tree. Obviously, it was only old Zacchaeus there, but it was a very particular and specific invitation, Zacchaeus. Andris, Sonia, Malcolm, put your own name into that call. Zacchaeus, come down. So in your mind, for a moment, just hear your own name and Jesus' voice now saying, Mary, Jeanette, Louise, come to me. And in that moment, Zacchaeus was not a hated tax collector. He was an object of the love of God. Like you are now. And yes, we are together and we share the fellowship of the believers, and we are one body and one organism. But you know what? You also, yourself, 
individuality is not sacrificed when we become part of the body of Christ. We still remain that person with that name and that identity and that career and that gifting and talents. And if I have one prayer for each one of us today, during these 40 days of being prepared to victoriously and joyfully celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, my prayer is that you will hear Him calling you by your name. And that you will have the faith and the openness of spiritual eyes and ears to see and to hear and to understand and to believe with your whole heart that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Eternal One, the, the Word through which everything was created, the One who was born from Mary and rose from the dead after He was killed by my sin and your sin, who was broken and was restored to life. Jesus wants you to know. And He wants you to hear during these 40 days that you are called by your name. It's no, there's no benefit in holding God at arm's length. No. God is everywhere. You may be saying no to God, you may be trying to run away. He's already waiting for you. <laughs> Where are you going to run to? You cannot run away from God. You cannot have an excuse. You cannot hide behind logic or intelligence or a busy program anymore. This is a season to respond to the welcoming of Jesus Christ. By welcoming, welcoming him into your heart, around your table, into your marriage, into your parenthood, into your life, into the very existence who you are, to the core of your life. That is his mercy and his grace. That is where remorse can stop and a new life can be replenished. Forgiveness can come into action. For your hands can be washed clean and your face spiritually. And you may enter into the holiest of holies. You can come into the presence of Almighty God. You can stand even though you're on this earth before the throne of God and say, my Lord and my God. Before I say Amen, can we all bow our heads and can we all in our hearts speak to God, speak to Jesus. Thank you that you know my name. I welcome you to my life. Let's take a few seconds. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we come before you humbled because we've grown up to learn that we cannot go into every house and that many people wouldn't come to our homes because they're too important or too busy or too powerful, even too holy. That it's hard for us to understand that you look up into the tree where we're hiding but are curious about you and your intervention and you holding our hand and you taking control of our lives and you steering our way and our journey in this world. 
Forgive us, Lord, that we worship, that we pray even, that we work and that we journey and that we struggle with questions in our minds without realizing that Jesus is around, that God is within us and around us. And so our prayer is that as we journey these 40 days of, of, of Lent, as we prepare our hearts to burst with joy and, and excitement on Easter Sunday, that it will happen every Sunday during this time, that we remember on the first day of the week, Jesus rose and He's alive. And He is in my corner. He's more than that. He's in my mind, in my heart. And O oh Lord Jesus Christ, when we offend You with our thoughts, with our anger, with our emotions, or when we offend You, please don't leave us or forsake us but forgive us and cleanse us and make us new every day because of your presence, because of your power, because of your love, because of your goodness, because of your holiness, make us holy too. We pray that each one of us, each member of Trinity Presbyterian in Linwood would hear their name, their very own name. And know that it is from God. Know that it is from the Spirit of God. Know that Jesus sent His Spirit to call them and call me and call all of us. And help us to welcome you when you knock on the door. Help, help us to, to, to be excited about you being willing to go home with us. And stay with us. And we pray for those who can't attend the worship services because they may be frail or that there may be a time for them to, to rest. That period of their lives might have come when it's not possible to attend. Thank you that you are there in that room, next to that bed, in their minds, in their souls, in their spirit, Lord, through your spirit. And this is my prayer that wherever these members are this, this morning, they will hear the call of Jesus in their hearts, by the work of the Spirit. We pray that our denomination will hear your call. Because we can have meetings, Lord, hours on end. And we often wonder if people, if commissioners, if those who attend know that Jesus is there if they would not count their words and curtail their thoughts to respect you and be obedient to you. Be there, Lord. Make known that you are there. Call our sessions and our presbyteries and our general assemblies and synods Call them by their name and make them humble before your authority. You are our King and our Lord. Yes, you are our Redeemer. Yes, you are the one who forgive us unconditionally because you pray, you paid for our sins with your own blood. There's no love, there's no more love possible than when somebody gives his life for his friends, her life for her friends. You gave your life for mine, for ours, for your church. I pray, Father, that during this, this quarter when this country is preparing to elect a new government, that we will also hear the voice of our Lord 
calling us by name to be faithful to Him and to the righteousness of His kingdom, of Your kingdom, Lord. And that when we respond to that call, we will know what to choose and who to elect. That joy and life and prosperity will return within the bounds of our country and our continent. Now I pray, help us. Open the eyes of our spirit and the ears of our spirit that we might see and hear you. And joyfully and with excitement journey with you, Lord, from here onwards. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come, let us now also together pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, power and the glory, ever. Amen.